Hi everyone, I am Jennifer Hancock, uh, founder of Humanist Learning Systems. This is the Humanistic Professionals Lunch and Learn for the International Humanistic Management Association. My co-host is Elizabeth. Please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Castillo, Assistant Professor at Arizona State University. Um, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. We're so thrilled to have you. Um, and today I'm the guest <laughs> because I have a new book out and Elizabeth and I decided that um, it might be a good time to actually just talk about humanistic management. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, and, and do the slideshow, hold on. Slideshow, it's beginning. All right, um, so what we wanted to talk about is how to actually apply the principles of humanistic management. And if you're a professor interested in the book, Business Expert Press can get you a um, desk copy to review in case you wanna use it for your course. It's good for ethics, strategy, things like that. Probably also HR. So let's start with um, defining what the philosophy of humanism is. The American Humanist Association defines humanism as a progressive philosophy of life that without supernatural beliefs affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. So let's break this down real quickly. It's a progressive philosophy, meaning we believe we can make things better. And better and good is a moral question. What constitutes things being better? And for a humanist, that means more flourishing and less suffering. We do this without supernatural beliefs. So we're not going to, um, if we need water on our field, we're not going to necessarily pray for rain. We're going to take personal responsibility to actually irrigate the field and make things better. We're not going to wait for supernatural intervention to make things better. We're going to do it ourselves. And to do that, we believe we have the ability to make things better. Um, and that's actually really important because if you don't believe you can make things better, you don't try. And because we believe we have the ability, we therefore think we have the responsibility to make things better. And how we go about doing that is we try to lead ethical lives. Um, by leading ethical lives, we experience good personal fulfillment. And the goal of our life is to aspire to the greater good, to try and make things better for the world and for humans included. Um, one of the questions that came up in the, the, the registration was, is humanism really the right term? Because it, it kind of smacks of speciesism, right? Are humanists um, focused on humans to the exclusion of everything else? And the answer is no. Uh, the way I think of this, is that I'm a human, I was born a human. Um, my value system is necessarily tied to my emotions, which I evolved to have, and I share with most humans on the planet. So I can't really be a very good alligator, but I can aspire to be the best human I can be. And again, best is defined by how well am I helping the greater good, um, which is not just humans, but also the planet we live on and all the animals and stuff. It would make no sense for me to be an alligatorism because I'm not, I have no idea what kind of value system alligators hold. I have no idea what kind of value system elephants have. I can't have this conversation. I used to work with dolphins. I've never discussed ethics and values with dolphins because we don't share a language to do that. The only people I can have this conversation with are other humans for the time being. And so to me, that's what humanism is. It's both uh, a, a focus on human values because that's what we are. We are humans, but also it's a reminder because most of what I do in my life is hang out and talk with and work with other humans. And so the word humanism reminds me to treat everyone I interact with as fully human. So for me, this is about personal, how I personally go through life and choose to go through life. I choose to be a good human being because it beats being a bad human being. And um, I try to remember that other humans are, you know, human too. So for me, I love the word humanism. It doesn't smack of speciesism to me. Um, I suspect that the idea that humanism would be speciesist comes from a hierarchical view of nature, which doesn't exist in real life, right? Um, I don't think of humans as superior to other creatures on earth. Like, why would I? Um, it's just not part of, that's not scientifically valid. It's like saying this leaf on a tree is better than the other leaf on a tree. 
it's a nonsense concept, but it comes out of an idea of hierarchy um, that I actually reject. So I don't view humanism as speciesist at all. So let's take the principles of the philosophy of humanism and say, well, if we were going to apply this to the world of business, what would that look like? Well, it's an ethical philosophy. So the first part would be to do no evil ethics. How do we create good, good being defined as more flourishing and less suffering? Um, the second part of that is the rejection of supernaturalism. How do we actually accomplish this? And for a humanist, that means using science and strategy. We want to be reality-based as much as possible so that our solutions that we come up with actually work, because otherwise we're not really accomplishing anything. The third part has to do with how you view other people and how you choose to act yourself. Um, and the title of that chapter in my book is called RESPECT, um, but it has to do with dignity and compassion. And this is something I seek to do for myself first. I, I try to carry myself with dignity and to treat myself with compassion. But because this is humanism, I'm also concerned about other people as well. I'm concerned about you know animals too. I've got a cat somewhere who's sleeping. But, um, but most of my interactions are with other humans, so it makes sense to focus on that. And I try to treat other humans with dignity and compassion as well. And then the fourth rule is personal responsibility, right? If there's a problem in the world that I think needs to be solved and could be made better and I have the skills to do it, then it's my responsibility to do this. My practice of humanism as a philosophy is a personal practice. It's a responsibility I have to myself and by extension to other people. But this is about not just saying, well, I wish someone would fix this. I'm going to fix this. This is how I'm going to be. Um, so those are really the principles that we're looking at when we're talking about, for me anyways, when, when I think of applying the principles of humanism to the world of business. How do we create businesses that are ethical, both in terms of their how they treat their customers and how they treat each other, and also what is the problem that they're trying to solve, right? Are they trying to make the world better in terms of more flourishing and less suffering? Or are they creating more suffering and less flourishing? And that's a question we should be asking ourselves. In, is our business creating more flourishing for society and for everybody and the world? Or is it causing suffering? Um, and then all businesses are in the business of solving problems, right? If you're not solving problems, you're not in business because no one's gonna pay you money just to pay you money. They want you to solve a problem for them. So how do we go about solving those problems? Well, reality helps us, science helps us. And how do we actually implement those solutions? They have to be implemented with dignity and compassion because if we don't do that, our, what we're doing is not ethical. It's not creating flourishing and, and benefit, it's creating suffering. Right, because if you don't treat your employees or your customers with dignity, you're doing evil. These are not, and the, you'll notice these rules are not standalone rules, they impact each other. Um, and again, it's your responsibility to do this. So a lot of the questions uh, that were asked had to do with what does this look like in real life when a company tries to implement these principles in real life, what does it look like? So I'm going into my past and I'm looking at some of the examples of companies I've worked for. And one of them was a company called Pinnacle Towers. And we were a tower management firm. We had radio towers and, and so forth that we leased out to you know, cell phone people and, and things like that. Now our acquisition and merger team, which is the part I was involved with, was matrixly managed. It was a matrix managed, which means it was flat managed, which means we didn't have managers. <laughs> Right. We were a matrix of equal partners. Um, and I don't know how many of you uh, have been in mergers and acquisitions, but um, that's not normally how most companies work. Most companies work in a hierarchical fashion where they have bosses that direct the work of lower level managers, which direct the work of even lower level people. And if you've read the new 1619, <laughs> articles that were in the New York Times, um, you'll know that that hierarchical structure was really invented to help uh, manage and control enslaved people. Um, it's not a very um, dignified <laughs> or compassionate way to, to 
get work done, but it's necessary if you're forcing labor. So if you're not forcing labor, how can you do this? Well, you empower your employees and you focus them on solving a problem collaboratively. And you give each person autonomy over their piece of work. And that forces people to work collaboratively because I have no ability to force someone else on the team to do their work, right? I can only collaborate with them to help them get their work done so that I can get my work done. And um, that actually works. It's crazy, but it works. So for those of you who know acquisitions and mergers, you'll know that most firms maybe do two acquisitions a month. We actually were doing eight a week. Um, we were spending about $25 million every week. And um, we were generating, I think, $10,000 of, of new income for the company every hour which is kind of outstanding. Now, who were these people that we hired to do this? <laughs> uh, acquisition mergers is often done by lawyers with um, high degrees. We actually hired people that had been fired from the other departments in our organization. And a lot of these people didn't even have college degrees. We had people doing land acquisition, because what do you need to buy property? You need to know you have the legal right to buy it. You need to make sure that the income on the property is there. Um, and you need to make sure your seller doesn't freak out while all the due diligence is done. And you need people to verify the, the state of the property. Does it need upgrades and things like that? We actually got people without degrees to work on these things and gave them an autonomy over their piece of it. We trained them up what to look for. And, you know, we are, our, our overhead was quite low. I mean, we paid people good living wages, but it was still lower than, you know, if you had to hire high profile lawyers. And we were kicking patootie on this. We once had a company come in and try to offer us, um, uh, you know, management of acquisitions. And we said, how many are you doing? And they said, oh, we can do two a month. We're doing eight a week. Right? This is the power of empowering people. And getting rid of the clutter, getting rid of the silos, and just allowing people to work and focusing them together on a common problem to solve. And people have the ability to do this. People that were literally fired from other departments, failed out of other departments, turned into some of our best employees. That's the power of treating people with dignity and compassion and focusing on problem solving in a respectful and compassionate way. Now, how did we use our company to do good in the world? We actually participated in our industry associations by lobbying for regulation. And when I tell people this, they're, they're kind of shocked. Why would you want more regulation? And the answer was we wanted less towers. Towers going up in places that towers didn't need to be, fewer towers, better quality, quality of life for everyone, and actually more income for us. It created a barrier to entry to competitors. So we were doing good and helping ourselves at the same time by doing this. So you can use, and you know, you have cell phones thanks to cell towers. We need them, but they do have downsides. And so if you can limit the number of them and maximize the use of space, you're doing good for the community doing that. And that was our philosophy about it. And we were able to make money at the same time. So I think part of it is we didn't have a single metric by which we were judging success, right? We were judging success holistically um, and it included how the employees were treated and included how our customers were handled um, and it included the communities in which we were operating. And another aspect of this is we had people dedicated to holding the hands of the sellers to make sure that their emotional needs were kept up so that they would go through with the deal. So that's one example of this. Another example of how you can use humanism um, and a humanistic approach to improving things is what I do for a living. I have an online learning company called Humanist Learning Systems. And a big part of my work is to teach how to stop bullying and harassment using behavioral science. And there's where the science is. Now, when we think about why we would wanna do this, why do we wanna fix harassment and bullying? Well, part of the answer is ethics. Bullying and harassment create toxic workplaces. People aren't treated with dignity. Um, it causes all sorts of problems in um, problem solving. And again, if you think of businesses as problem solving machines, 
anything that interrupts problem solving or makes problem solving difficult is bad for business. So if you've got employees that are lying to you because they're too scared to tell you the truth because the boss is a bully or the metrics you're using are really oppressive and so they don't feel comfortable telling you the truth, um, your problem solving is flawed because garbage in, garbage out. You get bad information, you make bad decisions. So why we wanna fix this is both ethical, it's not okay to treat people badly, but it's also pragmatic. It'll make our businesses better. So the next question is, well, how are we going to do this? Well, we're gonna use science and behavioral scientists have 70 plus years of research on how behaviors are learned and more importantly, how they are unlearned. And there's a protocol to create unlearning. And that protocol to create unlearning can help us train bullies to not bully. And I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. Right? Because this is a fixable problem using science. And we should be fixing it using science because all the methods we've been using, which is guesswork and just hoping, clearly don't work. And everything we see in um, the research on whistleblower programs is exactly what a behavioral scientist would tell you they'd expect to see. Every bit of research on bullying is exactly what a behavioral scientist would predict they'd see. We should be using this information. So once we decide, okay, here's how we're gonna tweak our system using behavioral science, then what? Well, it turns out in order to actually do this, in order to train someone who's being obnoxious to be less obnoxious, you have to treat them with dignity and compassion. And I'm not like making that up, right? That's really what the technique is. So we want to fix it because we believe people need dignity and compassion. We're going to fix it using science and science tells us to use dignity and compassion. Now whose responsibility is it to fix this? Yours. Like this is when I do a training for a company, I'm teaching individuals how to tweak their own behavior to create unlearning behavioral unlearning in another person which sounds really manipulative, but in real life, when I do a training, the immediate outcome is everybody starts acting more professionally, more dignified, and more compassionate, because that is the behavior that creates positive outcomes in another person. And so it's, your, it's the individual's responsibility to change their behavior, tweak it, they're not doing anything wrong, but you can tweak your behavior to create a different behavioral outcome in another person, and that's really powerful. So this is another example of if we were to apply humanism, how would a humanist go about solving the bullying harassment program? Well, it's this. Um, example three, I'm gonna use the International Humanistic Management Association. <laughs> um, we are organized as self-managed teams. Why? Because you can't have a bad bullying boss if there are no bosses. Um, dignity is embedded in all our interactions. This was a conscious choice we made. Um, we engage in collaborative problem solving because that's the best way to solve problems. And our work is focused on making the world better, changing the world and making the world of business and business schools better. This is exactly how humanists approach everything. So that's kind of it. We may not be shiny, happy people living in a humanist paradise yet, but we're making progress, which is good. Um, so there you go. Any questions? Elizabeth, do you want to start? Yes, thank you so much, Jen. That was fantastic. Um, and if you have questions, please type them into the chat box and I'll pick them up as you enter them. Um, for now, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, with the questions that some of you entered when you registered. Um, thank you so much for everyone for, for doing that. Um, so one of the uh, questions, this was from Carrie Lopez, um, are there core humanistic leadership principles that should be embedded in each and every training in an organization, whether or not they are leadership trainings or not? Yes, um, I do think we should be embedding humanist principles in every training. Um, when I do a training for an executive leadership team or even lower level people, Almost all of my trainings, and it doesn't really matter what it's on, whether it's change management or harassment or whatever, I start with the ethics. I start with the why. Why is this a pro problem that needs to be solved? Why do you as an individual, why is it in your best interest as an individual 
to want to help the company solve this problem, whatever that problem is. And I invoke ethics intentionally because without that, there's no, it's, it's a dry motivation. Like why should someone care about harassment in the workplace if they are not themselves experiencing it? But by invoking the ethical values, I activate their moral compass, which helps them feel motivated to make change. Because again, if you don't, if you're not motivated to make things better, to make progress, and you're not motivated holistically to help people, um, then you're not going to do anything with the information, which is why a lot of these trainings just kind of fall flat because they're not ethical trainings, right? But everything about, even if you're in a restaurant and you're changing your menu, there's probably an ethical element to that that can be invoked. Um, the next part of it is, is the training science-based? Is this actually going to work? Let's go back and look at what harassment trainings are. Almost everybody on this call has gone through a sexual harassment training and they sat through a training that was two hours of someone telling them it's illegal, don't do it. And it didn't really give them any information on how to make it stop aside from we'd like you to report it. And that's not what people want to learn. They know they want to stop it because the workplace has problems. But what they want is a science-based, how do I actually make it stop? training and we need to be providing that to people and i think you know and we do um the center for evidence-based management did a review on um implicit bias trainings um and and more <laughs> and what happens especially in this area of bullying harassment which is you know my field is that People don't know what's going to work, and so they make assumptions about what would help, and they think, well, maybe I need a bullying training. Maybe I need a harassment training. Maybe I need a civility training, but they've never gone to challenge their own assumptions about what's causing the problem and how to fix it. So the it's illegal, don't do it type of training actually contains an assumption, and that assumption is if we just tell the bully to stop because it's illegal, they'll stop. And it's ridiculous to think that that would work because bullying works for the bully, right? Whatever it is they're doing, they're doing it because they learned it works, so why should they stop? That assumption is a flawed assumption, right? What works to stop behavior is behavioral conditioning and modification. That's it. You wanna stop and change behavior, you need to engage behavioral conditioning techniques. So taking a step back and looking at why you think this problem needs to be solved as opposed to this one is part of critical thinking. And it helps us get to the root problem and find the real root causes of that problem and find solutions that'll actually work to fix the real root causes of the problem so that you can then build up a new culture within your organization, if that makes sense. But it all starts with the ethics which helps frame the conversation. And then you use the science and critical thinking to provide content that's actually going to work. Um, because if you go and do a training on stuff that's not going to work or it's on a proxy problem, you're wasting everyone's time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third part of this is treating everybody as an equal partner with dignity that they do want to help make the company better and solve the problem in a better way and all of the things that go with that. You know, not talking down and infantilizing people through a training, but encouraging them to empower them. And there's companies I refuse to work with if um, the upper management's not on board because I will not go in and provide an empowering training to people if I don't think that the leadership actually is okay with empowered employees. <laughs> and that's a real problem, right? Um, I was asked to give a training for students in um, Mumbai and I said, no, I'm gonna train the teachers because you do not want me to empower 5,000 kids if the teachers aren't ready for empowered kids, right? And this sort of training can empower them, but that's part of the humanism, right, is empowering people. And people need to be ready for that, so. Okay, great. So then the two of the things I heard you say then was starting with ethics as the framing for all these conversations and right. any um, training that an organization does. And then also getting to the critical thinking and questioning the assumptions behind whatever intervention uh, people are, or how they're framing the problem. Right, and making sure that the, the intervention is actually going to work before you train people on it. And behaviorally based, right? Well, yeah, it, it depends on what the, the problem is. Yeah, but if you solve the wrong problem, and half of, a third of my book is on reality-based problem solving, right? 
if you're solving the wrong problem, you're not fixing your problem. You're not fixing the real problem. Right, so there's so much about critical thinking that's central to the practice of humanism because wanting to be ethical isn't enough. You actually have to do good and create positive change in order to actually do good. And a good, again, good defined as more flourishing, less suffering. So the critical thinking, I don't think you can do this without the critical thinking because then all you're doing is good intentions. And the way my trainings tend to work is there's ethics, there's science, and then there's a reminder of how we're gonna do it using ethics. So there's, ethics is kind of, there's no section of it that's not ethical. Because even when you're asking what a good solution or outcome to the problem would be, the word good is an ethical question. What does an ideal solution look like? That's an ethical question. And we should be embedding that ethics into the discussion of what an ideal solution should be in the first place, even before you get to the training, <laughs> so. Um, so that takes me to a question that Andrew um, Miller posed. Um, he says, I struggle thinking through how to think through trade-offs. How do you think through decisions that seem that they could benefit one party, but may invoke some level of non-benefit or harm to another? Right. And that's always going to be a problem in all businesses, right? Um, and it's not a minor problem. So the way I think about it is how can I do the most good and the least harm and how can I mitigate the harm that might be caused by whatever this is? So with cell phone towers, cell phones do a great job of helping us stay connected. They solve a real problem. The world, you know, is improved. Our communication is improved. But, you know, you have to put the tower somewhere, right? And the community that's in, it's an eyesore, right? So how can you mitigate the harm that that's gonna cause? If we're generating electricity, the electricity generation, well, the electricity does a lot of good, but let's not kid ourselves, the places where power plants are, um, you know, often have health problems. Uh, if you've got a coal plant, they're, you're spewing out coal. So the question is how do you, the question becomes, okay, I've got a solution to this problem, but that solution is going to cause secondary problems to certain populations. So a humanist is going to look at those secondary problems and say, how can I mitigate them so that I minimize that harm or move the harm elsewhere so that it's not harming this population, right? Which is why the, the landfills are almost always on the outskirts of town, right? We, no one wants the, the trash heap next to their house. So can we move it somewhere? Is there technology like uh, to scrub the coal emissions to lessen the impact of what's coming out of coal stack? So these are the questions that a humanist manager is gonna ask to try to get us to the next level that we're not just looking for any solution, we're looking for the best possible solution we can find. And as I talk about in the book, it take, it's valuable to think through what an ethical, an ideal ethical solution might be with all the known downsides you know about and list them out so that you can plan for them. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it takes a little bit more time, but the people that do the most innovation are the ones that do this work. Mm -hmm. So it's worth doing. You might not get there on the first go, but you're going to keep looking to how to fix this and do the most good and the least harm. So one of the things I'm taking away from that comment then is it's important to develop the capacity to think systemically, oh. um, to not just look at a tunnel vision, what the problem you're trying to solve, but to anticipate what are the consequences going to be and look at different stakeholder perspectives instead of just a particular group. Exactly. There's no such thing as a solution that doesn't have consequences, right? <laughs> like, even if it's just like what email system you're using for your company, right? If there's... There's pros and cons to everything, and pretending that there's no pros and cons that you have to weigh is immature thinking, right? We, it, it's, it's a lot easier to not, to just pretend that those negative consequences don't exist, but that's not what a responsible professional person does, mm -hmm. right? The professional responsible person says, I'm responsible for this in its entirety. So what all do I need to know? What don't I know? And that's often an important question. And that's one of the reasons why empowering people and creating collaborative solve, problem solving teams is so important. I only have a small bit of information, right? But other people might have information that can fill in those blanks. So if we get together and collaboratively problem solve, we're more likely to identify those problem areas and design in solutions to them and head them off before they happen. 
right. And um, what is it saying that today's solution is tomorrow's problem, right? right. So exactly. you're trying to put in some anticipatory thinking from sustainability. Right. Um, Simona Brickers um, asks, um, Jennifer, please expand by defining ethics, um, especially since you mentioned it in the 1619 project. Sure. I, I ask because the foundation of the US economy has been based on Indian land acquisition and the institution of slavery, for example. Right. Um, so if you haven't been reading 1619, you need to get it, <laughs> download it and start reading it. I could, it's a long magazine. I've been reading an essay a day. So obviously the American economy from its inception has been founded on exploitation of land and, and of labor. Um, in the form of stolen lands and enslaved labor. And that has created certain economic functions and laws and also management systems that are very controlling. Because if you have unwilling labor, you have a high need to create control for that labor. And that's kind of where this hierarchy comes in. It's actually not a very good management style and it doesn't yield as much output as collaborative teams do and can. That doesn't mean you don't need leadership, but control is not leadership, it's control. Leadership is defining the problem and setting, recruiting in a team to work on that problem and helping them support them with the materials that they need, right? So if you think of movie making, right, there's the producer doesn't direct the film, they make sure the director has the support that they need to make the film. So I think we do need to kind of understand that a lot of the hierarchical systems we have are inherently abusive because they're direct descendants of um, enslavement control systems. And so we should be willing to challenge our assumptions about that and think about how to be ethical. And for me as a humanist, a big part of being ethical is treating other humans as fully human with dignity and compassion um, and helping everyone flourish. And not just everyone, but everything, right? Because we're an human animals. I need clean air and water. If, the, if the, the Amazon burns up completely, we could have a worldwide oxygen, oxygen shortage that will affect everyone, right? So if I want to flourish as a human, I need a clean environment and oxygen and clean water. And so does everybody else. And so to me, that's that's the how I define ethical. Something is good if it creates more flourishing and less suffering for everyone and everything. Now, that's not always doable as the other question had, like sometimes you, you're going to cause some harm. What do you do about that? There's a really great line in an Indian movie called Fauna. Um, and she makes the, the lead character makes the point, and this is what the whole ethical, ethics of the movie is about is ethics isn't about good and bad. It's about how to create the most good and how to do the least harm, the choosing between the greater of two goods and the lesser of two evils. That's what ethics is, and it requires judgment calls. And our judgment calls are never gonna be perfect. But we can at least make an attempt to do the best that we can. And so to me, that's what ethics is. It's a combination of my values and my morality and actively using those in all my decision-making which when I tell people this, they think it's a burden, but it's actually makes decision-making a lot easier because I now have a framework to make difficult decisions in. Um, can you talk, tell us about the New York Times article or just at some point that you had mentioned an article that talks about the hierarchy? The it's history. actually, yeah, the New York Times put out a special edition magazine called the 1619 Project. Okay. And it's about what if you told, like, our history is Eurocentric. Like, we tend to think in Eurocentric terms. So our history is when the pilgrims came over and, you know, the start of the country is 1776. What the 1619 Project is, is a way to say, what if we put the Black experience at the center of the history? And 16, August 1619 was the, the month that the first enslaved African Americans came to the U.S., um, and so it's, it's a, a series of essays and historical articles about the impact that enslavement of people and the stealing of lands have had on our economy and every aspect of our life from, um, you know, not just the economy and our laws, right, um, protecting property, 
but also healthcare and transportation, everything. Music, I just read the article on music. It's fascinating. All of this is very fascinating. But the, the article, there's a specific article that has to do with the economy and it, it touches on these issues of hierarchical control versus, which is not necessarily normal. I live on old plantation land. There were 200 people in, enslaved in my community, like literally on the land I'm on. Um, but down the road, there was a cooperatively owned fishing camp operating at the same time. So these two models of economic development, exploitation and collaborative, um, have always existed. And I think what I'd like to see as humanist is that we consciously move away from exploitation and recognize it for what it is, evil, and move more towards collaborative eco economic systems. And I'm not talking about, that sounds very, um, someone just shared their screen and they should not. So um, I don't know if we can, mm, I'm gonna stop participants sharing, there we go. Um, that doesn't mean I'm talking about communism or anything like that, but I'm talking about collaborative humanistic capitalism and collaborative humanistic um, economies. And that can mean a variety of things. It's still economic output, it's still capitalistic, but it doesn't have to be this controlling exploitative form of it. And I think the world would be better if we could you know, figure out how to do that and export it as opposed to what we did, which was export you know, exploitation. Okay. Um, but I don't want to rant, but I ranted. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, let's build on that. Um, David Wozaleski has a question. Um, Jen, could you elaborate how this book can be utilized for consulting projects for professionals who want to implement humanistic management? You have been talking about this in terms of training, but I think the audience would benefit from a brief tutorial on how to use your book for consulting. Sure. Uh, this is a magnificent book that is deeply important to connect theory and practice. Oh, thank you, David. Um, okay, so the first thing to understand is, um, and one of the questions that kind of came up in the, the, the questions that y'all wrote was, you know, how do we use this to implement it? And the first thing to understand is the first part of that is you personal responsibility, reading it, understanding it, and adopting what works for you out of this and changing your mindset about how you want to approach the world and the world of business. And then that allows you to, to then take the book and say, you know, if you're, you know, the question we always get, Elizabeth, is, well, okay, how do I get upper management to buy into this? <laughs> it's the perennial question. I've decided this is good. How do I get the rest of it? And the answer is, once you look at these examples that are in the book and the section on uh, strategic thinking and reality-based, science-based strategic thinking, you can start intentionally using those as tools to change the conversation within your organization about how problems get solved. So if someone's proposing, hey, let's do this, you could say, okay, um, have we thought about the ethical consequences of that, <laughs> right? You can share the book with other people as well and say, um, hey, I think it would benefit you to read this book. I would love that. My publisher would love that. Um, but it helps create a grounding for the conversation to occur, right? To, to identify a shared set of values, which is what humanist ethics are. They're shared human values. They are universal. Almost everybody you meet is going to respond positively to these and say, yes, the work would be better if our workplace embodied these values, right? So you can use the book to help gain consensus on what those values are, and then also help teach the, the, the critical thinking skills on how you go about problem solving and to jumpstart those important conversations within the organization. That's how I would do it. And that's how people have traditionally used my books because I've got books for kids and, and things like that. And people use them to jumpstart conversations. They say, hey, read this book. And then let's talk about how we might implement this, what will work for us, what won't work for us, things like that. So the starting point then is just getting to this meta level where you're looking at the higher um, things about the ethical implications, then always having that on the front burner. Right. It's, it's about personal practice. I keep coming back to this, right? You read the book and it should help you clarify for yourself what you think is important and what sort of workplace you want to work for. That step one is your own internal decision making about whether or not to prioritize ethics. 
once you've made a decision to prioritize ethics, then the question is, how do I start implementing? Right, and the implementation has to do with dignity and compassion and critical thinking. And those are not separate things, they're all intertwined. You cannot do critical thinking with, properly without thinking about other people as inherently having dignity and worth. Because otherwise, garbage in, garbage out. Garbage out, you have to get good information and good information requires you to think compassionately and with dignity about people that you might be at loggerheads with. Right, so the first part comes personal practice, what is it you value, and the book can help you clarify that for yourself and give you the language you need to clarify that for yourself. And then it also provides a tool to share it and say, hey, I'd like this in the workplace. I'd like it if we operated this way in the workplace. And it can be a small thing or a big thing. Um, Pinnacle Towers, we were just one department out of several departments, but we still managed to do this in our department and it completely changed the organization because of how much output we were creating by doing it this way. So, um, so John, building on that is kind of a, a devil's advocate. Um, or uh, Bill, or uh, asking, how does the humanist base give you the capacity to interact and deal with stakeholders who have a strong moral framework based on a particular religion or other ideology not consistent with humanistic values? How do you deal with people who divide the world into saints saved versus sinners damned, for example? Um, I, usually, I usually don't have a problem because most of them actually do use, um, like I said, humanist values are not unique to human, practicing humanists. Most religious systems in the world have a similar basis to their religious codes. They just use whatever the religion is to validate them, right? And as a humanist, I don't need that external validation. It's just these values stand on their own for me. But when people, when I encounter people of faith, I get along with them really well because I'm talking to them. You know, I'll say, you know, let's look at this as compassionate. And they understand that and they say, yes, let's do that. Um, it's actually really rare the number of people that are just like that don't value compassion and well-being is actually pretty small now they're really loud and really vocal um, and they have a lot of political power right because like, I live in Florida <laughs> like my county commission only recently had enough power to get the active confederate members to not have power over whether or not we have a confederate statue at our courthouse right um, so that's still an active force I don't go for those people, right? If you're anti-human, any human, then I'm probably not gonna be able to reach you, but everybody else is reachable. That's like 80% of the population, right? So I focus on the common human values we have, and that's what humanism does for me, because it's not about faith, it's not about lack of faith, it's about what do we have in common as humans, and how do we work together as humans to fix whatever these problems are. And then the science, and this is what's really cool. One of the first Western humanists is, so is Socrates, weekly Socrates. And the Socratic method is actually validated by science. <laughs> like if you wanna change people's minds on the most contentious political issues ever, whether it's abortion or the death penalty or whatever, use the Socratic method. The only way to really use the Socratic method is by treating the person you're asking questions. You're not asking these questions to make them seem stupid or to point out flaws. You're using this to help have a conversation. Maybe there's something you don't know that they do know. You're using it with humility and with dignity and compassion for yourself and them to have an honest conversation and to uncover the truth. And that's what works. So the Socratic method is validated by science, but in order to do it, you need to be dignified and with compassion and not view it as a conflict. And I get this all the time. I'll go on radio shows and they, they're expecting a conflict and I just don't even think in those terms. So I almost, I don't usually respond to conflict questions as if they're a conflict question. I treat them as a valid question and I just go along and answer them because this idea of conflict that I have to win and you have to lose, that's so toxic. And if we can move away from that, and the way you move away from that is by recognizing the humanity of the humanity, dignity, and worth of the other person, it, it, it changes everything. It changes these dynamics completely. Mm -hmm. And it, it's one of those things, I do a six week course on, um, it's called Living Made Simpler, how to actually implement 
these values in your daily life. And there's a unit I have solely on compassion, on the practice of compassion, how you yourself can use compassion as a tool. And everybody always comes back to me and they're like, Jennifer, everything's different. <laughs> Just everything's different. Because when you use compassion, a lot of times we think of compassion as something we're doing for someone else, but it's actually a tool you use for you. It's not going to necessarily change the other person, but it's definitely going to change how you interact with and perceive what's going on. And it's going to help you think more clearly and it's going to, it's going to change everything. When you stop acting as a threat to someone else, they often stop acting as if you are a threat and compassion helps us get there. And again, that's centered to how we deal with bullying and harassment and things like that. And people never believe me, but it, once they try it, they're like, oh, this is why every religion and philosopher throughout history has preached compassion. There's a reason it works. It's very functional, huh? It's very functional. It's a very pragmatic skill and it changes everything. Like I go through life pretty happy most of the time because I almost never have conflicts with people. Not because I'm not speaking my mind and holding my space and being opinionated. I am, but I don't approach interpersonal interactions as a conflict. Or I try not to. And when I find myself in that frame of mind, I remind myself to get out of it and to, to reset myself so that I can reset the dynamic. Um, so Simona has a question. Um, how do we include all stakeholders? Because often access and opportunity is not equally available. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> right. There was just an article um, about testing for gifted kids, right? And a school decided that they were gonna test all kids. And the demographic makeup of who was in the gifted program changed entirely. So the process that used to exist is a teacher would recommend a kid for testing for giftedness. They've just decided to test everyone so that no kid falls through the cracks. That shouldn't be a revolutionary concept, right? But it is, and it just happened, and it's you know, 2019, right? So there's ways we can tweak our systems to be more inclusive and to also be more intentionally inclusive. And this is what um, affirmative action is about. Human decision-making, our brain is a big gooey gray mass of stuff sitting in a chemical bag. Our ability to think clearly and rationally is actually really limited. And it's limited further when you incorporate all the behavioral conditioning that our brain has been subjected to, right? So in order to overcome those biases that might not be you know, racial bias or sex bias or whatever, but we have these biases, in order to come overcome that, we can institute systems that help us get out of our own biases to look at things more objectively um, and, to, and to look at, to just to look at everything differently. But that comes back to personal responsibility, right? This is a personal thing that you have to do in order to even suggest it to others, right? But the solution to that is um, intentionally randomizing things. Um, and there is some science that random selection for like employment will yield a better outcome and better employees than maybe bias selection where I'm trying to find the right person usually means someone like me and they might not be the best person for the job. So there's a whole field of study about how to create more diversity and more opportunity um, out there. And I would say both science and compassion and dignity um, and looking at our processes and how our processes discriminate accidentally or intentionally. A lot of times it's intentional. Um, you know, how do we fix those and, and restructure things so that we're not blinding ourselves um, because we just can't even see that there's a problem. So. Okay. Um, and John just pointed out, besides um, the African Americans who were discriminated against, there were also other groups such as Asians and Irish. So I wanted to point that out for the system. Oh, no, everybody experiences it. I mean, poor people experience it of any color. This is why A. Philip Randolph, a humanist, um, you know, had a workers union, not a black workers union, but a workers union, right? Um, so yeah, it's everyone. Everyone is subjected to this. Um, okay, and Roland has a question. Um, one issue that intrigued me when you mentioned it is behavioral conditioning. Mm -hmm. Did I get it right that you meant techniques to eliminate or change bad or immoral and ethical behavior? I just Googled the term, but what I found is just techniques that help me to change my behavior. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so if you go to Google Scholar, so behavioral, behavioral psychology um, 
you know, you go, you go back to B.F. Skinner, right? Um, and his work with like pigeons and things like that. This has now been validated. Like every cell in your body responds this way to stimulus response. Um, dogs respond, everything responds to stimulus and response. That's just how we learn. Um, and so, yes, there's been a lot of use of this um, by psychologists to help individuals flourish. Most of modern psychology is based on humanistic approach. It used to be that we treated things like epilepsy um, as demonic possession, or we would just lock people away. But with the advent of the humanists like Maslow and, and um, I forget his name, we'll just move on. But they changed it to say, look, every individual has value and worth, so let's help them flourish, right? And reduce, and, and, and reduce that. So psychology does use these techniques to help individuals overcome um, addictions and things like that. But this same knowledge, and it's established knowledge, there is no counter examples in the literature over 70 years of how behaviors are unlearned, is very useful for any unwanted behavior you want to stop. Um, so if you want to stop aggressive behavior towards you, you can use this to do that. Uh, a lot of it is directed at yourself, and I do have programs on how to use this for yourself and how to understand your own resistance to change. But we can also use this um, to improve change management adoption within an organization because it is the, this is how it's, this dynamic is playing out whether you acknowledge it or not. And the humanist uh, psychologist, uh, Viktor Frankl said, we don't have to allow our conditions to condition us, but basically the only way to resist the conditioning is to understand how conditioning occurs so that we can resist it, but we can also use that for other things. Uh, abusive relationships, why is our abusive relationships so hard to get out of? Why is there a spike in violence when someone leaves an abusive relationship that tails off? All of that is explained by the behavioral science literature. It's all predicted in the behavioral science literature. We need to just start using that actively because we are being subjected to behavioral conditioning all the time, both positive and uh, malign. And in order to resist the malign stuff, we have to have a better, it's, think of this as a defensive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so become aware of it then. Become aware of that, yeah. But everything, it, your cells in your body respond to addictive substances the same way. It's happening on so many levels simultaneously um, that it's like not understanding this is, is the reason we haven't solved so many problems. <laughs> um, so I wanna give a shout out or thank um, for Linda Urban um, shared a resource, National Issues Forum, NIF, has a great issues guide that present varied ideas from different perspectives to use to foster dialogue and deliberation, find common ground and understand different points of view. Perfect. And I think the, the metaphor for me is so often we look at things as a two dimensional picture, but um, the, what you're talking about, Jennifer, and that what Linda said is it's really helping understand things more like a cubist painting is to try to see all different dimensions simultaneously. Exactly. I want to just, we're 10 minutes out. So if anybody needs a certificate of completion, I have HRCI, HRCI, SHRM and general certificates. Just put your email the name you want on the certificate, and which certificates, you can have one or all three that you want. So, and just put that in the chat room and we'll pull that down and I'll get those out later today, so. Okay, thank you, Jen. Um, Dr. Marty Schumacher has a, a comment. Um, as a former organizational psychologist, some of these principles are taught as um, hum ethical management principles, but not under the heading of humanistic management. Is right. there a university in Canada that has a course particularly in humanistic management by title? Um, no, but that's what we're trying to change at the International Humanistic Management Association. <laughs> right, and, and ethical management almost always would look like humanistic management because as soon, in order for you to do ethics universally in a secular, pluralistic, religiously plural society, you have to remove the religious language from the ethics, which leaves you with just the ethics, which are common human ethics. Um, and I think the difference between ethical management and humanistic management is ethical management is one dimension, right? Humanism is not just a value system. It's also a methodology about how we go about problem solving and why we go about problem solving this way. 
And so, uh, you know, I look at a lot of self-help stuff and it's very motivational and they quote actual humanists all the time, like members of the AHA and the British Humanist Association. Um, and, but what they usually are lacking is integrating those ethics into a strategic problem solving process. Humanists are not just interested in being ethical. Being ethical isn't enough to create ethical outcomes. You have to engage in critical thinking and reality-based decision-making in order to create the best possible outcome and not do accidental harm, unintentional harm. So a humanist would never say ethics is enough. When you look at humanist literature and you go into the humanist philosophic movement, we don't talk about ethics much at all. Almost all of our literature is on critical thinking, uh, logical fallacies, and science promotion. And the reason for that is because ethics is actually pretty easy. Like most people in the world agree on what ethical is. What we're having problems with is implementation and strategy. How do we get to the outcome we wanna have? How do we even agree on what a good outcome is gonna be? But more importantly, how do we gain consensus on a solution? And that's what we humanists spend our most of our time on is the critical thinking part because wanting to be ethical is the easy part. Thinking through to a solution that's actually going to work is really, really hard, which is why almost nobody does it. And those who do it don't usually do it well. So think of humanism as an intersection between ethics and, you know, critical thinking and decision making and personal responsibility. Okay, so it's got to be a multidimensional then. Yeah, exactly. Ethics isn't enough. <laughs> Okay. You also need critical thinking and you have to embed the ethics in the critical thinking. And then you have to take personal responsibility because otherwise, if you're constantly blaming everyone else, you're part of the problem. So the buck stops here. Yeah. Yes. We have power. Um, well, we have about three minutes left. Do you, would you like to take another question or would you like to um, wrap any closing, concluding remarks? Sure. Um, get the book. <laughs> Um, you know, if you thought this was interesting, get the book. Uh, it's out at Business Expert Press. Um, you can purchase it there, both in an ebook form and as a paperback. And if you're a professor and are thinking about using this, again, if you want to introduce the concept of how we talk about ethics to the course, uh, this book has that in it. If you want to talk about how to integrate ethics into strategy, strategic planning, this book has like half of the book is on that. So, um, you know, get a desk copy and consider adding it to your course. And, um, you know, and I'm always here to answer questions. And also join the Humanistic Management Association if, if this really resonated with you, because, you know, the question of how do we get this into the courses, that's what our association is attempting to do. And the workplace. And the workplace. Yes, the workplace too. You know, that's, we're yeah. trying to do three things, right? is how do we change business education? How do we change actual businesses? And then there's all the laws that need to be worked on that would support all that because a lot of the laws we have right now are actually written for in the management of enslaved people and enslaved property. property. Um, and until those laws get changed, we're still gonna have, we're still gonna be fighting headwinds. It's like the B Corps the laws have to change to make B Corps a thing, right? Mm -hmm. So we need the schools, we need the businesses, and we need politics simultaneously. Okay, and um, Dr. Marty Schumacher just gave you a shout out, just bought the book and started reading it. I can see how your writing is easily understood by people of many ages and educational levels. It is very clear and not full of academic rhetoric. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I'm not an academic. <laughs> I have a bachelor's degree. <laughs> Okay. Great, great critical thinker. Um, do you want to say any last thing about teaching the principles? I know that was a question. Yeah, okay, so one of the questions that kept coming up is how do we teach our ethics without running into uh, religious pluralism problems, right? And the answer to that is that um, you talk about just the ethics and not how you arrived at the ethic, right? So if you believe God gave everyone compassion, great, but just talk about the compassion, right? Because almost everybody has compassion except for psychopaths where so that brain doesn't activate. Um, but that's like 1% of the population, right? So, but everybody else has compassion and they're going to explain their compassion in different ways. And how you get to compassion is less important than the 
discussion about compassion than the compassion itself. How do we actually do compassion? How do we actually actively apply our compassion? Right? And that's how you get past the religious pluralism is by ignoring the religion and focusing on the underlying values, if that makes sense, that are shared by everyone. And then peop what people do is they fill in the blanks and they say, yeah, that's consistent with my teaching. Right. Um, I'm not a religious person, but my first book was, is used by religious groups. Um, I had a preacher's wife say it was a good add-on to the Bible because it validated um, her, her values as a Christian in a non-Christian way, in a very here and now sort of way. So these values, they work. There's a reason every major philosopher and, has, and religious leader has taught these values. Mm -hmm. um, we just need to focus on the values and that helps us connect with everyone everywhere in the world. Like, so when I went into India a couple of years ago, they said I sounded like an Indian. I sounded just like an ethical Indian, even though I'm an American living in Florida, because I was talking about universal values, the human values, humanist values. Okay. So. Well, thank you so much, Jim. This is just fantastic. Um, Georgia just said a big thank you um, for your work, and um, I'm sure everybody appreciates that, too. Um, any closing remarks or want to say goodbye? No, that's it. I'm going to stop the recording now, and then we can keep talking.